Hey, welcome to Next Level Church Online. My name is Jason. I'm so glad that you are here with us. Before we go any further, would you mind praying with me? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity to gather virtually to give your name praise. We thank you for what you're going to do in this service, and we will always give your name praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now listen, coming up next is our worship part of our service. Please get ready with the heart emojis and hand claps. And wherever you are, whether you're at home in your living room or you're in a coffee shop, don't be ashamed to sing out with us. And you say, hey, Jason, I don't know the words to the song. Got you covered. The words will come up on the bottom of the screen and you'll be able to sing confidently and with great power because you know what the words are. Right after that, we're gonna come and tell you about our Make a Difference Project. Our Make a Difference Project is an initiative where we partner with local community agencies and we make a difference in the lives of those people attached to those part of our community. And immediately following that, Pastor Eric, our discipleship pastor, will come back with some in the know happenings so you can understand and be aware what's going on here in the life of Next Level Church. And then right after that, I'm excited that Pastor Ra will come with part two of the presence of God. And to close the service out, I'll be back to let you know what's happening next and how you can have a life in Jesus. Stay tuned and worship team, let's go. We're gonna start in our time of worship. It's good to see everyone today. Let's sing out and worship together. Captain, 
like you that sits on throne on high. We thank you that you sit on a throne of mercy and of grace. We just worship you. You're seated on the throne of mercy. Your glory shining bright for all to see.
is here with us currently. It's always with us. And uh, well, we just want to welcome your spirit here in this place and thank you for uh, the ability to gather and to worship and to sing uh, about your goodness and about your mercy and about your grace and about your love. So as we continue in worship, God, we, we, we just be aware of who you are. nothing worth more that could ever come close nothing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord holy spirit and holy spirit you are welcome here come and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what I
So hold on, don't, don't sit down yet, because in just a moment, we're going to come back, we're going to sing that chorus one more time, okay? But I want, I want to read something to you about the presence of God. Jesus told us, and he was talking to his disciples one day, and he said, hey, I, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to abandon you. And, and he looks at his disciples, and he says this about the Holy Spirit. He says, if you love me, obey my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will send you another advocate. The word there is also counselor, one who comes alongside you, who will never leave you. Just think about what Jesus said to the disciples, and he is saying that. See, they were looking forward to the time when the Holy Spirit would come and be with them and never leave them. And now we're looking back, seeing that Jesus has already fulfilled that promise by sending his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is present when his people are present. And then he goes on and he says, and the Holy Spirit will guide you in truth. So when we're saying, you're welcome here. What we're saying is we need your presence we need you to be our advocate. We need you to be the one that leads us in truth. Will you just, as, as strong as you can, with every voice in here, would you sing this chorus just one more time? Let's sing it together. Hey there, Next Level. My name is Jason. Thanks so much for being with us today. I'm so elated to be part of a church community whose mission is to love Jesus, love people, and make a difference. Every month, we partner with one of our community partners in order to make a difference, and this month is no different. This month, we're partnering with Compassion International. It is their goal to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. What I really love about Compassion International is that they commit to a child for the long term. And it's through this relationship, Compassion International takes a multifaceted approach to come alongside these kids to promote a holistic approach to include social and spiritual care to help foster a bond that will equip them to break what would normally be a life of poverty and despair. Listen, by sponsoring one of these kids, you will be able to send them letters, photos, and foster and develop a lasting relationship that will positively affect kids for years to come. Here's where you jump in. Our goal is to sponsor 50 kids, and I want to extend the opportunity to you to do just that. To sign up to sponsor a child today, text Next Level to 833-93. Again, text Next Level to 833-93. 
If you have any questions, you can email us at admin at nextlevelchurch.net. Now, get the hearts and the hand clapping emojis ready as we welcome back my friend, our discipleship pastor, Eric. What's up, Next Level Online? My name is Eric. I'm the discipleship pastor here. And I want to take a moment to say hello, especially to those of you who are joining us for the very first time. You are our honored guest. And we would love the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Uh, you, you. We hope that you're already jumping into the chat and engaging with people. But we have something called the Stick for Three challenge that we would love for you to participate in. It's pretty simple. Here's what you do. First, you sign up for the challenge. We're going to drop a link right in the chat that you can follow. And then you commit to coming back to Next Level Online three more times. And the reason we encourage you to do that is we want you to have the opportunity to get to know who we are as a church to determine if this is the church for you. And at the end of that time, we have a special gift for you for those of you that complete the challenge. So uh, take an opportunity right now or after this service to sign up for the Stick for Three Challenge. Well, I have something I want to share to those of you that are new parents. We have a child dedication coming up. We have three opportunities. Wednesday, September 22nd and Sunday, September 26th at both the 8.30 and the 10 a.m. services. This is an opportunity for those of you that are new parents. You have a, a newborn uh, baby up to three years old to dedicate them publicly to the Lord in front of the church. The, it, what you're going to do is you get to uh, publicly demonstrate that it is your desire to raise up your child to follow after Jesus, and it is the church's opportunity to then encourage you and affirm that we want to be a part of that journey with you. If that's something that you are interested in, all you need to do is sign up and pick the service that you want to participate in. You can do that by following the link in the chat. Well, for a second, I'd love for you to join into the, the chat and answer this question. Um, if you, I'd love to hear, are you a planner or are you someone that just is go with the flow? Planner or go with the flow? Jump into the chat, give us the answer. Now, I'll admit that I am a more go with the flow kind of person, that, that planning actually takes a lot of work for me. But even as someone that is much more go with the flow, that is okay with going without a plan, I want to talk to you about the benefit of planning. I want to give you an example. You know, I often, I started this year saying I wanted to go and work out at the gym. And one of the, one of the things that I found is that if I did not make a plan for when I was going to go, then more often than not, my day would just get filled and I'd find myself at the end of the day having not gone to the gym. So the change happens when I made the decision that I was going to plan ahead. I, I would, the night before, I would pack my gym bag, I would get everything ready, and I would make a determined time for when I was gonna do it. And, and that helped me to be a lot more successful, a lot more consistent with going to the gym. Well, wh what does that have to do with our faith? What does that have to do with our walk with Jesus? Well, to me, I think it has everything to do when we talk about generosity and giving. You know, there are certainly times when God calls us to spontaneously give, to spontaneously be generous as we see a need that arises. But when it comes to our giving, I think there is a real benefit to actually planning how we're going to give to the Lord, how we're going to give back to see His church and the mission carried out. And I want to share with you just one scripture. This comes from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 32. And this is what he says. But generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. I love that. It says that generous people, they plan to be generous, and then they stand firm in that. And so how does that apply to, to you and I? Well, I, I want to encourage you, you, of course, be spontaneous when God calls you to spontaneously give. But I would love to encourage you to start planning your giving. That means if you're a, a single person, um, then I want you to stop and prayerfully consider how God would have you to give. If you're a married couple, 
come together and prayerfully consider. Look at your finances and say, God, how do you want us to give? How can we plan to give? And then follow that plan. And I believe that you'll see a lot more consistency and greater generosity in your own life. Now, if you're someone that wants to give, all you need to do, you can follow the link and give safely and securely online at any point during this week. Well, now it is time for us to jump into the scriptures as we continue our series, The Presence of God. Last week, we started talking about how we need to be connected to the vine, and, and our goal is not to pursue the fruit itself, but to pursue God. And as we pursue God and His presence, then we will start to see the good fruit overflow in our lives. Well, I don't know about you, but I am ready to hear about the word that Pastor Rob has for us today. And so uh, grab your Bibles, grab something to take notes, and let's get ready to jump into the word together. And now, let's welcome Pastor Rob. Well, welcome to everyone that is here in person. And I want to say welcome to those that are watching online. Today, we are continuing our series entitled The Presence of God. And we kicked things off last week. And we talked about, I gave a big idea. And the big idea was spiritual fruit isn't made by focusing on what you want to change, but by focusing on on God. And that was our big idea last week. If you missed it, make sure you go back and listen to, uh, you can listen to it on iTunes through, through our podcast, or you can uh, watch it on demand through our Facebook page or, or website. Spiritual fruit isn't made by focusing on what you want to change, but by focusing on God. This is so important for us as Christians, because as Christians, all of us have an area of our life that we want to improve. All of us have an area of our life that we want to grow. There's some area in our life that we say, ah, I'm not exactly where I should be. And so often we don't see the results because we're focused on trying to change our lives. But last week we looked at how Jesus said we cannot change our lives on our own, that we are, we are, are dead in our own efforts, that it is through abiding in, in Jesus and when we abide in Jesus, which is just a word that means to make your home in, when you rest in Jesus, when you're in his presence, he does the hard work of changing you from the inside out. And he does that through his presence. Last week, we looked at two important words when it comes to God's presence. The first one is God's omnipresence. God's omnipresence is simply how we describe that God is not bound by space or time. God is everywhere. Everywhere you can go, God is there. Everywhere, literally everywhere, in every circumstance, in every day. He, God is in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future. God is not limited by our space or our time. God is everywhere. Even when you can't feel God, God is there. We can trust that God is around. He doesn't take vacations, he doesn't go to sleep, he's not distant. God is everywhere. But there are certain times where we feel his presence. And it's almost like uh, if you're tuning on a radio station and there's sometimes where there's static and you can't find the right station, but then you tune to the right thing and it's like beautiful music. That's how the presence of God is. That there are some times where it's like, okay, God, I know you're around. I know you exist. I know you're moving. I see you're doing great things in other people's lives, but all I'm getting is static. 
And then there's other moments where we get to the right station and it's like, ah, I'm, I'm in tune with God. That is what we call God's manifest presence. God's manifest presence. God's manifest presence is when humans experience the presence of God. Another way to say that is that God is here. God's here. It's those moments where you get the chill bumps on your arm. It's those moments where you hear that still, small voice speaking to you. It's that moment where you're just like filled with this raw emotion and you don't know where it came from. It's that moment that you have boldness that you didn't know you had because the Spirit of God prompts you. It's this moment that like changes your life. And what we want to do is we want to get to being and experiencing God's manifest presence on a more regular basis. Because God's presence is moving and active. God's presence is around. People are experiencing his presence. But why not us? Why, 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 if he's going to move, if he's going to do something great, like why doesn't he move in us? Why can't he do something with us? And that's what this series is all about. That when we tune in to the presence of God, when we experience the presence of God, he does the life change. And last week we looked at the verse where Jesus talked about seeds and he talked about fruit. And he talked about abiding in him and that when we abide in him, we produce fruit. But we have to look at another portion of the Bible to see what is that fruit. The fruit that you produce, that God produces inside of us when we abide in him. Uh, Galatians 5, through 23 tells us what that fruit is. The fruit is, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know anyone that would look at that list and say, nah, I'm good. Like, I don't know anyone that would say, you know what? I just got too much joy in my life. Like, I could really use, I could use some bad news and like, I just, I need a little bit, like, I just got too much joy. I don't know anyone that's like, uh, you know what? Um, I, I have too much peace. Like, God, would you please grant me a spirit of anxiety because I just am too peaceful about the world that we live in. I don't know anyone that would look at that list and say, that doesn't look good. In fact, I think every human being looking at the list would say, yes, I need more of that stuff. I could use more love. I could use more joy. I could use more patience. And if God provides that stuff, the question to ask is, why aren't Christians producing that fruit? Either God is telling a lie and he doesn't give us this stuff or there's something going on with us experiencing his presence. Could it be that we can be close, we can be in proximity to God, we can be around godly things, but still miss out on his presence? Anytime we're not experiencing the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control of God, it is not because God has moved or disappeared, it's because we have. That in the presence of God, we produce these amazing things. It's in the presence of God that marriages become healthy marriages. It's in the presence of God that addictions, we overcome them. It's in the presence of God that we, we get all this stuff that we want, all the stuff that we say, all the stuff that we talk about. We keep waiting for like a light switch to go off and for our lives to be instantly changed. And God says the change comes in the presence of him. But we need to talk about why. There are so often so many religious people, church people, who can be around God and can do the things of God, but don't produce the fruit that God promises will produce. I don't know if you get asked this, but on a somewhat regular basis, I get asked, and and maybe it's because I'm a pastor, but people will come up to me and they'll they'll say that they are so frustrated by Christians online. And they're so frustrated when they get on Twitter or on Facebook, and they're just so discouraged about Christians. And then they say this, and this is the question they ask me. They say, I just don't understand how Christians can be so ugly. I don't understand how Christians who who have a God that talked about love can be so unloving. I don't understand how Christians can be so judgmental. And there is a difference between being in proximity of God and abiding in God. The reason that Christians don't produce fruit is because they may be around God. They're not anti-God, but they're not allowing the presence of God to change their lives. And Jesus actually addresses this. This isn't a new problem. This isn't a modern day problem. This is something that went on even in his day and age. Jesus gives uh, uh, this sermon, and it has to do completely with being around the presence of God, but not really experiencing it, not getting that fruit that we talked about last week. And I want to show you this in our text. I think it's really eye-opening and really important for us. 
Um, at Next Level, we honor the text, and the way that we do that is we stand to our feet. So I want to invite you to stand to your feet and read with me nice and loud, Matthew 13, 14. Now, we do something that's a little bit uh, odd. Um, when we see the two dots, we pump our fists and we say dot, dot. And I want to invite you to, uh, to pump your fists and say dot, dot. Um, I cannot promise you this, but I can almost guarantee it that if you pump your fists, the presence of God will move in your life. I can't promise. I can't promise it, but I can almost guarantee it. Will you read it with me nice and loud? It says, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Matthew 13, dot, dot, 14. Now that we've read the text, let's go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you, and uh, we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to just come to church. We don't want to just do spiritual things, God. We want our lives to be changed, and it's changed in your presence. And so we invite you into our hearts. We invite you into our minds. We ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts in a personal way and that you'd give us the courage to obey you even when we're scared. And God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. All right, I want to break down the text that we're, we're going to read. Uh, but as I break down the text, I want you to be thinking about some areas in your life that you would like to change. Um, these would be some things that maybe you've heard in a sermon, something, and you're like, yeah, I want to get better at that. I would love to pray more. I would love to read my Bible more. I don't know why I don't share my faith. I wish I would share my faith. I wish I had boldness to do this. It's all these things that you kind of have this list of like, one day I'll get to it. One day I'll do these things. And you hear something and you're like, yeah, I think God's leading me to do this. But then this never comes around. You never actually do it. I want you to be thinking of those things because the crowd that Jesus talks to had a list of things that they never got around to doing. And I want to show you in, in our text. Jesus is addressing the religious crowds and specifically he points out why they don't change. Here is, is, uh, is, is what happens. Uh, we're going to start in Matthew 13 verses 1 through 9. It says, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. I'm on a boat. While all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. He was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, would you just read those next three words? Let them hear. So that's the sermon. All right. I don't know what you would be thinking, but in a modern day context, if someone got up at church and just said that thing about seeds, and then said, thanks for being here, we'll see you next week, I would be like so disappointed. Like, I don't get it. What in the world are you talking about? And I think when I used to read stories like this, when I would read the parables, I think, how come people aren't asking questions? Like, how can be, they, they be so happy with this story? Why would, literally, I feel like it's a waste of time that a large crowd gathered together. Jesus has, he's like, they're captured at every word that he says, and he wastes their time by telling a story about seeds, and he doesn't even explain it. And they're okay with that. I'm like, what is going on here? But then I think about how often we, as a culture, seek out entertainment. And I think about how often we will just unplug and mindlessly scroll on social media and not really think about what we're consuming. Or I think about how easy it is to just watch TV and just binge watch show after show and not ask yourself, like, what am I even digesting? What am I learning? What am I listening? We're just mindlessly being entertained. I think about music, how music is a very powerful tool that God has given us. But you ever listen to a song and you've listened to it a lot and you know the words. And so when it comes on the radio or it comes in your car, you can sing along. But when someone says, hey, do you know what that song's about? You're like, no, I have no idea. I've got every word memorized, but I don't have a fat clue what the song is about. Like, there are lots of songs out there like that that I bet you have no idea what, what they are about. Uh, you, you, you know the song Walk This Way by Aerosmith, also covered by Run DMC? 
I grew up listening to that song, loved that song, thought it was amazing. I loved mixing the rock and the rap, and I loved it, saying it, memorized all the words. It was not until I was a college student and I actually started listening to the words that I learned that that song's about losing your virginity. I thought it was just about walking like Aerosmith. Like, I just thought it was a cool rock song. Had no idea. Maybe you, you like uh, Clearance, Clearwater Revival. You know the song Proud Mary? You know what Proud Mary is? Marijuana. It is literally a song about smoking weed. It's about our jobs are hard. Look, read the lyrics through this lens. Our jobs are difficult. Our jobs are hard. Come get on the boat with me. Roll Mary and smoke it and you'll forget all your problems. That's what the song's about. I used to listen to a kid's version of that song. I was like, I love Proud Mary. Like, Proud Mary's awesome. No idea it was talking about marijuana. I do this, though, with church songs, too. It is so easy to come and to just sing words, and we don't even analyze or think about what we're actually singing. It's so easy to be the crowd that Jesus is literally addressing. They came for the show. They came just to hear a story, but they, their life wasn't changed. I think about when I was in, in youth group. I don't know if, if you grew up going to youth group or, or not, but I grew up in the 90s going to, to youth group. And the 90s were a very special time. Uh, there was a lot of good things that happened in the 90s in the church world, but there was also a lot of really cheesy things that happened in the church world. And I didn't know better because, like, I didn't grow up in any other decade. The 90s was all I knew, so I just went along with it. And I went to youth group. And the songs that we sang were not passionate songs. They were not songs that, like we sing here at church. They were very cheesy, corny songs, and they all had motions. And I very rarely analyzed the songs and actually thought about, what am I singing? I just would do the motions, and I would sing them, and they would get stuck in my head. Now, some of you can relate to what I'm talking about because you grew up in a, a similar uh, environment that I did, but some of you don't have a fat clue what I'm talking about, so I'm going to force you to experience what I experienced in the 90s. There is a song that we used to sing all the time, and I'm going to teach it to you, and I'm going to make you do the motions. If you're watching this online, I want you to participate. You think I can't see you, but I can see you. I'm going to teach you the song and the motions, and then you're going to participate. This is an all play. We're all going to do it. The lyrics are actually going to come up on the screen. Here it is, the song. This is a song we sing all the time. It's a bop. It'll get stuck in your head. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. And then you repeat that. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. You got some in the road and some in the weeds. But everywhere you look, you got the little bitty seeds. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. Okay, you guys, some of you participated. And it wasn't even your turn. Like, you jumped the gun. You know this song. That's great. Well done. Now we're going to do it together, and this is an all play, okay? All of us are going to do this. All right, now that we got it. Here we go. One, two, three. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. You got some in the road and some in the weeds, but everywhere you look, you got the little bitty seeds. The word of God is like the little bitty seeds scattered all around. All right, that song's going to be stuck in your head. You're going to be singing it just driving down the road. And here's the thing. As a youth group kid in the 90s, I, that was my jam. I was like, that's a bop. I love that song. I didn't have a fat clue that was in the Bible. I never even asked, why are we singing about seeds? I didn't even ask, what do these seeds mean? I was just like, the word of God's like seeds. That's great. I love that song. We got the motions. I never even asked questions. And so when I first read this story where Jesus tells a crowd a parable, I come to it with some judgment. And I'm like, how dare those people not ask Jesus what the story meant? Why would they show up and not have their lives changed or ask hard questions? But then I look at my own life and I think, how often do I get close to the presence of God, but I don't dwell in it so that my life is not changed? How often do I sing these words about dedicating my life to God and I raise my hand, but yet I don't actually do what the song is singing? How often do I consume stuff and don't even realize what I'm putting in my mind or putting in my ears? And this is, this is what happens in, in, in Jesus' day. The crowd doesn't ask any questions. They're just entertained. They walk away saying, that was a good church service. And that was really good, man. Thanks, Jesus. Good word today. They walked away and their lives weren't changed. But there was a few people, Jesus' disciples. 
And Jesus' disciples pulled him aside and they said, hey, um, we don't really understand what the whole seed story was. Can you explain it to us? And I'm so glad they asked that question because this is what Jesus says. This is why I speak to them in parables. Matthew 13, 13 through 5. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts have become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, and this is so important, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. So the disciples say, hey, what's the deal with the parable of the seeds? And why do you always tell all these parables? And Jesus says, I tell them parables to give them what they want. I tell them parables because they're always going to be hearing, but they're not really listening. And then they wonder why their lives aren't changed. They wonder why they're not experiencing freedom because they're getting just close enough to God to check off a box, but not close enough to God to actually do what he says. And so from there, Jesus actually explains the parable of, of the seeds. Matthew 13, 18 through 19. He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So Jesus then starts to give an explanation. And in this explanation, he is going to define what the four seeds are. And the four seeds represent the four different types of ways that we hear. When it comes to experiencing God's presence or hearing a sermon or reading the Bible, there's four types of people that hear. This is four different things that they do. If you're taking notes, you could write it down like this, four types of hearers. And I want to tell you explicitly what these hearers are. The first one, Jesus says, is the people that we hear but fail to understand. Jesus says in the parable of the seeds, there's people who come and they hear, and they're like, that was great, that was a great sermon. I come every week, and man, that, that was funny. I liked it. They hear, but they don't understand. You know, there are a lot of people that are not anti-God. There are a lot of people that are cool with God. Me and God are bros. Like, I love God. Like, God's great. They like God, and they're not anti-God, but yet their life isn't changed by God. And that would be those people who come and just hear and just, just listen. Yeah, I went to church, and yeah, I do some church things, but I don't, do, I don't understand what it means. I don't ask questions. I don't, I don't really dig in. Life change happens when we truly understand that we are sinners. If we really would understand that, we would run to the presence of God. But so often Christians are like, yeah, I'm a sinner, but yet we try to live life in our own power, in our own strength. If we truly understood how sinful we were, we would not get out of bed until we met the presence of God. Because in my own strength, I'm not good enough to change my life. But so often we understand, yeah, yeah, that's a good word. But life change doesn't happen because we fail, we fail to understand. So this is someone who maybe goes to church for a while. This is someone who enjoys the positive message, but never plugs in. It's someone who hears the things of God and just says, yeah, I'll do it on my own time, or I'm cool with God. I'm not anti-God, so I'm good. I got a ticket to heaven, so that's, that's, all, that's all I need. So they think that because they're in proximity of God, that they're cool with God, but they don't understand that the life change doesn't happen just simply hearing the story of God. It comes from understanding. Jesus says this about the second group of seeds, Matthew 13, 20 through 21. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So the four types of hearers, number one is we hear but fail to understand. Number two is we hear but fail to abide in Jesus. Did you catch what Jesus said about the seeds? That they hear the word with joy. I love church. I love God, man. I love it. All this stuff is great. But as soon as difficulty happens, because they have no root, they fall away. Can I just tell you that it's great if you love church, but church doesn't change your life. Jesus does. And I hope that you love church. We try to make church as enjoyable as it possibly can be. But can I just tell you, life is hard. 
life is really hard. And so many people come to God almost like it's this bartering system. Like, God, I'm cool with you. And so if I do a few good things for you, then you've got to give me a good life. And as long as I have a good life, I'm cool with you. But if you don't do your end of the bargain, then I'm out of here. God, I'm cool with you. And so I put a little money in the offering. Uh, God, I served once on, on on a Sunday in the kids' room. That should count for like 12 blessings. You should help me out, God. God, I've done something for you. Now, I expect a good life. And as soon as turmoil happens, they fall away. And they say, God, you must not be real. God, you don't exist. And Jesus says the reason that happens is because they're not plugged into him. There's no root. Every single person that's living, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to experience difficulties. And following Jesus doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. But it does when you follow Jesus It does give you a system to plug into that you know no matter what you go through, the presence of God will help you get through it. I heard this quote a long time ago, and I have no idea who originally said it, but the quote is, true joy is not the absence of pain, but the presence of God. And I think that is so true that so many people are thinking that if I have God, that means that everything in life is going to be happy and good. But that is not joy. True joy is the presence of God. Experiencing the presence of God that can look at difficulties and say, hit me with your best shot, but you cannot knock me down because my Lord and Savior has risen from the grave. Jesus um, then goes on to talk about the third group of seeds. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. This is Matthew 13, 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. This one may be hard for some of you to hear. Because Jesus says that some people aren't changed, and the reason they're not changed is because they're trying to find their fruit. They are abiding in their wealth instead of abiding in Jesus. And it's easy to do, because it's easy to trust our own strength and our own power. And it's easy to think, yeah, if I have money, then all my problems will go away. And If I ever have a problem, I'll just write a check. Or who uses checks? Why did I even say that? Who writes checks these days? If I got a problem, I'll just pull out my debit card or credit card. And I'll solve solve my problems. You know, there are way too many Christians that would not think twice about missing a day at work. But they will think twice and they skip all the time spending time with God. There are Christians who would not think twice about the luxuries of life and just spending money to make themselves happy. But there are Christians who would think more than twice. They would say, I don't really know if I want to trust God with my finances. I don't know if I can trust God with my life. And Jesus says that there's there's a warning here, that there's nothing wrong with having money. If you're blessed financially, I think that's amazing. Don't feel bad because you have money, but money should come with a warning label. And the warning label is be careful because money can nab you. It can grab you. It can steal your heart's attention. You can get to a place where you can say, I'm cool with God, but my trust is not in God. It's in my finances. And the finances don't produce the fruit that God does. The finances don't produce the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness that we want. But some people's lives aren't changed. And Jesus says specifically, it's not changed because they hear the word and they're like, yeah, I love the word, but they find their home, they find their growth, they, they abide in their wealth instead of Jesus. Then there's a fourth group of seeds, Matthew 13, 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times What was sown. So just the ending should get our attention. That the person that does this is the one that produces the fruit. And it's not just a little fruit. It's a a, a huge crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. That's amazing. Think about this just for a second. I don't really understand how seeds work. But my understanding is if you take one little seed from an apple and you plant it in the ground and you fertilize it and you, it rains on it and God does his thing, whatever he does with seeds, that one little seed produces a tree that then can produce dozens of apples. And Jesus is saying that in his presence, when you abide in him, 
when you find root in him, when you trust in him more than you trust in yourself, more than you trust in your finances, that's the way the crop is produced. It's not produced from anything else. He didn't say that the crop is produced from when you go to church, which going to church is great. But you can go to church and miss the message of God. And he didn't say the crop is produced by just checking a box, by reading the Bible and saying, okay, God, I did this for you. Now what are you going to do for me? No. The seeds grow because of the presence of God. So four types of hearers. The fourth one is we hear and we show we understand by focusing on Jesus. There is this direct connection, and I don't fully understand it, but there is a connection between God's presence and our obedience. There's just this connection. There's this thing that God knows that he really has our heart, not just when we show up, but when we show up and say, yes, Lord, what do you want to do? When God has our heart and we say, okay, God, I'm scared, but I'm going to do it anyway. When God has our heart and he says, okay, that's not really my idea, God, but if it gets me closer to your presence, I'm, I'm going to do it. And that's why our big idea for today, if you're taking notes, which I encourage you to do, our big idea is we hear and we show we understand by focusing on Jesus. And that's what I want us to get out of it. I don't want the people that call Next Level their church to simply attend. I love, I love that people attend. I, I, I would love it if every seat was filled at every service that we had and if we could reach hundreds of people. I would love it. But I never want to be a church of thousands of people who are forever hearing but never understanding. I want to be a part of church, and I would take even just a handful of people who would say, the presence of God is what changes my life. So whatever, God, you say, it's what I'm going to do. Whatever you tell me to do, God, even if I'm scared. God, God, we should start with you. You said to start with, with you, to come to you, and the rest will follow. Okay, that's what I'm going to do, God. I, I, I just, I, I, I'm too scared to live this life outside of your presence. So I'm just going to do everything I can to get to you. I just want to be around you. I want to submit to you. I want to do what you want me to do. You say to yourself, I just don't have enough strength to obey. Get into the presence of God and watch what happens. You say to yourself, I, I just don't really want to obey. Like, I, I really just don't like, want to live for God. I could be honest enough to say that. Just get in the presence of God and watch what happens. Maybe you say, you know, I, 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 don't, I, don't really, I don't really even like this whole church thing. I come because my spouse dragged me here. Like, that's okay. Get in the presence of God and watch what he does to your heart. Maybe you heard those seeds, the four different seeds, and you saw yourself in the first three, and you're like, yep, that's me. I put 100% of my trust in my money, or I, I love God as long as things are going well, but when life gets difficult, I just push him away. I run away. Or, or maybe you're like, yeah, I, I, I hear sermons, but I don't really apply them. I don't really understand what they're doing. Maybe you can relate to one of those three seeds. Can I tell you, everything changes when you get into the presence of God. Everything. And that takes us to today's win. Today's win is what type of seed do you want to be? If it's a seed that experiences life change, understand that it only comes through the presence of Jesus. The seed is the word of God. It's when it's preached. It's when we read it. It's really important to our lives. But understand, just being around the word of God, just being around the presence doesn't change our lives. It's when we allow it to take root, when we live in his presence, and when we do what he says. So what type of seed? do you want to be? Will you pray with me? God, we come before you and we just thank you that you are a God who gives infinite chances. And God, so many of us just struggle because we constantly rely on ourselves. But God, I ask, I ask that you would speak to some hearts today, that right now in this moment, you would be speaking to some hearts and there would be some answers that say, God, whatever you say, I will do it. I'm tired of living in my own strength. I'm tired of trying to do what, what I want to do. I'm tired of trusting in just my money and touch, trusting in my strength. God, I can't change my life. God, would you speak to us tonight? Would you help us to do what you tell us to do? In Jesus' name, amen. Wasn't that an amazing word about the presence of God? Thank you, Pastor Rob, for showing us in scriptures and in practical living about how the presence of God has power and influence in our life. Now listen, you may be here and you don't know who Jesus is, and we want you to experience that same presence. 
The Bible says where God's presence is, there is fullness of joy. Coming to know Jesus is a happy moment. It's one of the happiest moments of our lives as believers. As believers. Please, if you want to know who Jesus is, don't hesitate. Don't wait until tomorrow. Let's make that decision today. If you have questions about what salvation is and how you can interact with you, please contact me at jason at nextlevelchurch.net and I'll be happy to answer your questions. But our hosts are here. We're ready to pray with you and to extend the fellowship of Jesus to you. Now, we believe in taking action next steps. So if you're saying, I want to be saved right now, we got you covered. Online community, can you join me and we pray for our sister and our brother that has just accepted Jesus? Let's do it together. God, we thank you for our brother and our sister who has surrendered their life to you. They believe that you are the son of God, that you died and you were buried on the third day, you rose again with all power in your, in your hands. And God, we thank you for salvation being their portion. We thank you for them being in a right relationship with you and that they can call you the good father. So God, we thank you for this opportunity to share salvation with someone else. God, we thank you and we know you always celebrate when we have a new family member come into the fold. So God, we thank you and we give your name praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, it was just that simple. So if you prayed that prayer and you believe it, you are saved. We want to hear from you. So again, email me at jason at nextlevelchurch.net or drop it in the chat. And I promise you, we will celebrate with you with the balloons and the cake emojis. Hands up. We are so glad that you are here as a brother and sister in Christ with us. Now, until next week, we are going to continue in the series, The Presence of God. But we can't wait to be back with you next week. Can you do me a favor? Invite someone. You know what I'm about to say. Invite a friend. Invite a family member. And there's a special jewel in your crown. If you do what? Invite one of your enemies. So until next week, be blessed and be productive. We love you and we pray God's best for you. See you next week.